Steve, what an honor it is to be in this company. A special thank you to John and Peter. And thank you, Joanna's haiku and <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, uh, Mitsuya Yamada's 1976 poetry collection, Camp Notes and Other Poems, opens with a section devoted to My Issei Parents, Twice Pioneers, Now I Hear Them. The poems in this section present the voices of her parents and her own struggles to comprehend them, as in a bedtime story. Here it is, and I'll read it. Once upon a time, an old Japanese legend goes, as told by Papa, an old woman traveled through many small villages seeking refuge for the night. Each door opened a sliver in answer to her knock, then closed. Unable to walk any further, she wearily climbed a hill, found a clearing, and there lay down to rest a few moments to catch her breath. The village down below lay asleep, except for a few star-like lights. Suddenly the clouds opened and a full moon came into view over the town. The old woman sat up, turned toward the village town, and in supplication called out, Thank you, people of the village. If it had not been for your kindness in refusing me a bed for the night, these humble eyes would never have seen this memorable sight. Papa paused, I waited. In the comfort of our hilltop home in Seattle overlooking the valley, I shouted, That's the end? <laughs> <laughs> a stark cultural rift between first generation Issei, that means first in Japanese, and second generation Nisei opens as Papa paused, I waited. This pause is filled with utterly divergent expectations. While the father rests to take in the fable's lesson, the child cannot accept its conclusion, and the poem ends with her outrage. And yet the poem gestures toward telling similarities between this young speaker and the elderly subject of Japanese legend. Each reposes on a hilltop home, and each overlooking the valley enjoys a measure of comfort. To young Mitsuye, Papa recounts an incomprehensible Japanese consciousness but his old legend suggests a shared situation and, critically, a mode of consolation with potential utility for their own comfortable lives. Like the elderly woman, the Yamada family will be banished, and her father's bedtime story suggests a cultural and existential resource for the plight they will be made to endure. And while the child decries the legend, its value to her father may be what the mature poet can finally hear in, in camp notes. Generational differences are always magnified in immigrant communities, but immigrant exclusions layered with competing and ultimately fractious U.S. Japan relations resulted in vexed divisions between Issei and Nisei. Long deemed aliens and eligible for naturalization, first generation Japanese immigrants were only permitted to naturalize in 1952, the final year of the post war U.S. occupation of Japan, and nearly a decade after Chinese eligibility. The unalterable fact that Issei were Japanese subjects, compounded by Japan's consolidating imperial power in the period, thoroughly conditioned Issei attitudes. Positioned between two empires, Issei drew on Japanese national and imperial consciousness to manage their place in America. And when open conflict erupted between these empires, Japanese political and cultural resources became a fraught liability. The vast project of internment corralled an entire community, but upon securing this population, military and government efforts quickly pivoted to the more complex population, a problem of sifting through it. Every official effort to distinguish between loyal and disloyal detainees incited fresh waves of partisanship within the community, and generational divisions previously felt within familial terms hardened into political fault lines. The American-born population was permitted a measure of civic rehabilitation and later integration, albeit scant and hard fought, that was never entertained by their parents. This disenfranchisement persisted and often hardened after the camps were shattered. The afterlife of this division was readily apparent decades later in Nisei efforts to expose the spark of forgotten wartime incarceration and seek redress and Yamada is one of these activists. Eloquent Nisei activists spoke for and sometimes against their parents, and their testimony demonstrated and instituted assumptions of Nisei's silence and attendant and an attendant political quietism. The legacy of this rift is evident still in the significant body of popular and scholarly commentary on this wartime incarceration, which has largely ignored Nisei's experience in favor of exposing the state's injustice against its American-born citizens. I want to consider a neglected Issei perspective deeply informed by Asian cultural resources by turning to the wartime painting of Chiura Abata, uh, whose visions of Topaz, the use of the Utah relocation camp to which he was banished, resonate deeply with the gratitude and supplication of the old woman in a bedtime story. The force and majesty of the mountains and sky move both of these projected figures who attain a profound consolation that has long been misrecognized as a politically unsavory quietism. Jiro Obata traveled to the United States in 1903, determined, as he put it, to come in contact with great nature, and that's his key term, great nature. Then 17 years old, Obata had already garnered acclaim as a young artist in Japan. 
Obata's American career began as a penniless schoolboy, as he said were called in the period, who earned his keep as a household servant, and he endured virulent racist attacks. With the recognition of his artistic skill, however, Obata eventually garnered a faculty position at UC Berkeley. In contrast to the Japanese modernist artists who journeyed west to study European art and methods, Obata adhered to his Asian training, utilizing Japanese methods to capture the exhilarating spaces he discovered in the American West. At the core of Obata's artistic practice was his repeated refrain, Ten Chi Jin, Go With Nature. Um, as he stated in a 1933 public lecture, nature gives us endless rhythm and harmony in any circumstance. And his pedagogy was devoted to methods for absorbing these cues and patterns. In his teaching, Obata enshrined three, three principles composing the mind, correcting the posture, and breathing, all recognizable as foundational elements of Zen practice. His particular nexus of monkish practice, reverence for nature, and aesthetic awareness culminated in his greatest work, his 1927 paintings of Yosemite, which you may know. Um, when Obata ventured into Yosemite, its formidable grounds had already been deemed unpaintable, like in 1927. But for Obata, the transports of Yosemite were proving ground for his Zen discipline. His mental and physical preparation facilitated his comprehension in Zen terms that mountains are mountains. In Yosemite, Obata achieved the direct encounter that bridges mountain itself to permit a new order of crystalline perception, and it was there that he appreciated most fully what he termed nature's broad tolerance. Obata's deeply held conviction in an aesthetic recourse to intolerance would be put to the test years later during his four term incarceration when his mantra of go with nature would acquire new relevance. Like other incarcerated artists, Obata visually recorded the epic and disorderly process of internment. He sketched his 1942 removal from Berkeley and imprisonment at Tamperin Racetrack, where those collected from the Bay Area were assembled until the fall when they were removed a second time to Topaz, the manufactured city of Barrett in the Utah Desert. In Obata's words, internment was a, quote, sin that is intolerable, a deeply unnatural project. And yet the sin of internment permitted Obata a rare access to his revered great nature. In the Utah mountains, Obata encountered a landscape that returned him to the heights of, his, of the artistic discipline that he had attained 15 years earlier in Yosemite. Mountains and sky, moonlight and sunsets. Utah's alpine wasteland, in Utah's alpine wasteland, Obata's paintings achieved anew the majesty that his intervening works had often not sought and his faith in the tutelary value of great nature acquired special relevance in the context of mass incarceration. From the earliest days of his detention in Tamperin, Obata had labored to establish art classes. In his 1942 New Year's address to the Topaz Art School directed his students to the landscape, quote, have we noticed the beautiful mountains surrounding us that have existed for thousands of years? They show heaven and earth their greatness. The mountains, moon, and sun never try to explain. We only hope that our art school will follow the teachings of this great nature, that it will strengthen itself to endure like the mountains and like the sun and moon, will emit its own light, teach the people, benefit the people, and encourage itself. The mountains provide models of strength and endurance and crucially self-encouragement. That these natural bodies never try to explain is central to their appeal for Obata. They foster, they foster and nurture their own implacable existence. Decades later, in a 1965 interview, Obata recalled those mountains, quote, I feel profound gratitude for these things. And in that sense, to put it briefly, I did not feel abandoned. Instead, I learned a lot. If I hadn't gone to that kind of place, I wouldn't have realized the beauty that exists in that enormous purpose. Obata's reasoning here is striking. The gratitude he expresses is consolatory in a highly defined sense. The lessons he took from that enormous bleakness are pointedly not the stuff of silver linings. Instead, to go with nature in this instance is to inhabit a position of strength and the consolation he drew was a reasoned and felt understanding of a profound source of order and endurance. At Obata, uh, sorry, at Topaz, Obata was permitted to make excursions into the surrounding foothills, and from these vantage points he produced paintings striking for their serenity. While he depicted acute hardships within the camps, as in ske his sketches of the violent dust storms that whipped through the barracks, his most expansive renderings presented a natural order. One exquisite painting, Moonlight Over Topaz, was designed for particular appeal. Obata painted this piece to present to Eleanor Roosevelt upon the visit she made to Topaz, and the painting remained in her private collection until her death. See the, the painting depicts the entry to the camp with a pool of water caused by a broken water main in the foreground. In Obata's vision, the moon presides over a haze of ochre from which the mountains emerge, and tufts of desert brush gleam in the moon's light. Indeed, the vertical strokes that constitute these patches of light seem to extend up into the sky. 
In the middle distance, the uneven line of desultory buildings, a handful of camp outbuildings bisected by a fence with a guard tower at the center, is pitched along one side of the campus, trailing off its edge in a shoddy approximation of the mountain range. It is telling that Obata designed this piece to be received by the first lady, come to survey the results of her husband's executive order. Though Obata had made careful studies of the human suffering in the camp, he offered a singular perspective of the camp's entry point. This, the outcropping of camp structures is pointedly insignificant. Indeed, the overall composition of the painting would sustain its balance in their absence. To this famous visitor, then, Obata offered an illustration of his core aesthetic philosophy. And in the context of his incarceration, the politics of his effort are particularly significant. To return to Obata's Zen practice, it is worth considering the social and political exigencies of Buddhist practice in the Far East, in which Buddhist retreat could itself be a political act, one which could be returned to the political sphere. Obata's mantra was not a remove from divisive social and political realms, but a means of healing them. If we return now to a bedtime story, we may see that the elderly woman's gratitude is a revelation of her own strength. While the young Mitsuya decries a missing indictment of an exclusionary community, <coughs> the young woman's thankfulness marks the achievement of her discipline. She does not merely endure. She appreciates a vision that is ultimately her own. She has elected to go with nature. She has achieved a personal height in her conduct, figured in the story as a literal summit. It is worth emphasizing, too, that her supplication is also her triumph. The Zen riddle that mountains are and are not mountains resonates here in the woman's thanks that is also no thanks. Both attitudes exist as she arrives at a new order of self-comprehension. The elderly woman's achievement is most salient because it is meant to be transmitted. The father's pause in the poem resonates with Zen practice in which enlightenment is attained by an intimate transmission. She wrote Obata's fervent belief in nature too and trained powers of transmission capable of healing and guiding communities. A rigorous Zen awareness structures these natural encounters and their aesthetic exhilaration is inseparable from a critical and highly revealing exposure of their plight. It is my contention that their aesthetic appreciation does not excuse unfriendly and indeed hateful manners. Their meditations instead evince an internal transformation powerfully attuned to the place of exile. That this gratitude became a source of outrage and even shame reveals the profound limitations of what we have come to know. This vantage point at the summit of the mountain marks a contradiction that was unus unusable and even unintelligible to the basic Nisei activists, whose politics of resistance and collaboration did not accommodate the difficult political reality of a generation ineligible for citizenship. Put simply, Nisei were Japanese, and Nisei emphatically were not. For Nisei, in an era of rabid anti-Japanese racism, Japanese cultural resources were taboo, and Obata's gratitude for seeing not only politically inert, but backward. That his discipline should be, could be read as appeasement demonstrates a casualty of the political discourse activated by the racist incarceration of Japanese communities during the war. It is a strange fact that Issei resilience became a political liability for Nisei redress. Nisei and subsequent generations of internment writing has come to be defined against the problem of Issei stoicism, but I would like to turn to a key Nisei document to reconsider the revelations of Nisei consolation. Nisei poet Toyo Suyumoto's posthumously published internment memoir, I Call to Remembrance, comprehends but also spans the fault line between generations to launch a different order of indictment. The memoir opens with a dedication to her son, Kei, who died at 16, and the author's preface that follows frames her internment story by spelling out its connection to the death of a long child. Um, this is from the internet. What happened in that period from the early spring of 1942 through the late autumn of 1945, brief enough in retrospect, but long in the then, I now recall from writings of my own at that time in prose and poetry, as well as mementos and camp publications. The period spanned the infancy of my son and distorted what might have been his helpful development. The experience eventually canceled his short life. Kay became, a, her son became an intern when he was five months old, and in the camps, his vulnerability registered all of their deprivations, notably including the inhumane conditions of the horse stables, um, hastily converted into lodgings at, tam at the Tamperan racetrack, where Kay developed a deadly reaction to horse dancer despite never in life encountering a horse. In 1942, upon his arrival at the assembly station, Kay wasted away and was removed for a terrifying two weeks to be treated for pneumonia, an episode repeated in Topaz for a second bout of infection. The asthma attack that he did not survive at age 16 was directly tied to the pulmonary weakness he incurred in this early period. It is Kay's death frames to be his camp on art. Within the camps, his lively exploits are the focus of his extended family. Intergenerational communion lies at the heart of Suyumoto's memoir, 
which is as much an homage to her mother as it is to her son. Suyamanto presents her mother as a model of Issei resilience whose endurance Suyamanto holds up as a difficult standard for her own conduct. In Suyamanto's admiration for her mother's control, coupled with the grievous loss of her son, her memoir gathers itself into a poor <coughs> indictment that goes beyond the division between Issei docility and Issei rebellion. A single instance of this realization appears in Suyamanto's account of her first days at Tampa, of a long quotation that I should have put in the slides. So, uh, one night about 2 a.m., I awakened to a latrine located at the corner of our stable. I put on a bathrobe and wooden clogs and stepped outside onto the porch-like walk with several steps leading down to the ground that had just recently been added to the front of the stable. I thought I heard a voice called halt, but did not realize the command was for me. I took a few steps forward, my clogs clattering on the porch. I heard a swift, whistling sound pass over my head. I stopped in fright. Then a searchlight swung around and I was caught in its glare. I stiffened though I thought I could hear my own heartbeat. The sentry must have thought twice because then the searchlight moved away in an arc against the darkness, and I scurried off, my heart pounding, my legs shaking on my necessary errand. It is difficult not to read this as Althusserian interpolation, but unlike the policeman's hey you in that street theater, Suyamoto doesn't recognize that she has been hailed. Indeed, the terror of the scene is the fundamental misrecognition in stages. She does not answer the hail, but the bullets whistle and the searchlight's glare capture her all the same. The passage illuminates an instance of profound undoing in which the person who joins the bathroom to step onto the porch becomes a creature who scurries off into the darkness for the most basic necessity. This is more than an illustration of strict citizenship. It lays bare the conditions of racist existence. If the ground of Nisei political critique has been premised on an assumption and defense of citizenship rights, Suyamoto's negating interpolation instead comprehends the dark continuity between citizen Nisei and Nisei ineligible for naturalization which extends to the third generation of sons of Oscar, as well in canceling her son's life. And so, when the bullet whistled over Suyamoto's head, she was nearly killed by the political assumption that prevented her from comprehending her true condition. Perhaps we may begin to understand Issei's serenity as a more chilling knowledge. This incarceration exposes what the Issei have been living all along. Issei consolation does not offer comfort. Instead, it comprehends an existence that is at once bare and full. Suyamoto offers a striking phrase for this realization in the passage in which she details the experience of snowfall in Topaz, a foreign experience to many of the detainees in Topaz who mostly came from the Bay Area. The young and old seem to reflect the philosophical acquiescence of the Issei in bearing the rigors of the weather. Philosophical acquiescence significantly re recalls the, the classical genre of the consolatio, which reasons for grief. And in recent critical effort, in a, in a recent critical effort to recuperate consolation as critical solace, David James argues for a shift from reception to expression, quote, where solace may be reconceptualized in compositional terms, and in another recent turn to the consolations of writing for prisoners of conscience, Rivka Zim marks a shift from critique in the prison to appreciating the mind of the prisoner. In both cases, formal order permits existential comprehension and aesthetic release. I'd like to close by looking at a series of haiku um, <laughs> inspired by the snow in Topaz, composed by Suyamoto in 1943 and sent to a friend outside. A small thing to give, but I give you the silence of moonlight on snow. The petaled snow falls too gently, or not a blade of grass has grown to the sea. The flowers of snow conceal the barrenness, oh, that I should know. But take the silence if you will, it holds substance of my heart still song. In the memoir, the poems, these poems immediately follow Suyamoto's expression of philosophical acquiescence, and they showcase the exigencies of Japanese form. These haiku follow the syllabic conventions of the form, with the exception of the third in the series, whose middle line is one syllable short, um, conceal the barrenness. This loss triggers a cut, um, which opens into a declamation that chafes against the constraints of the form. I read this inappropriate lament, oh, that I should know, as the particular cry of Nisei awareness and outrage, oh, that a Nisei should know, that Nisei should be consigned to Issei knowledge. But the form holds nevertheless. The final who <coughs> contains the heart still song. Indeed, um, in adhering to the seven-syllable count um, in the central line of this last haiku, Suyamoto omits the article, um, from the substance, to produce a subtly broken English. It holds substance, and we may sense here the faint echo of the Japanese speaker. Um, the Japanese form can bear Suyamoto's second-order burden of knowing that she should not. This is highly self-aware. This is a highly self-aware poetics of consolation, 
that demonstrates formal control over irreconcilable content and its consoling power manifests.